Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. I am Lai Sun Kane, owner of uh, Lai Sun Kane, a gallery based in Boston. Um, uh, I am very excited to have uh, with me two artists who are currently in a per two person exhibition at my gallery. Uh, their names are Anina Major and Dimitri Espinoza. Uh, the exhibition title A Chorus of Marks and Artifacts is on view through July 18. We will have the artists take turn presenting and at the end there will be a chance for everyone to ask questions or share uh, your stories if you want. Uh, please feel free to uh, type your questions in the chat or Q&A box below your screen. So this exhibition is about culture and identity. Subjects are very close and important to me. I am constantly conflicted by where I belong culturally, my ethnicity, which is Chinese, or my country of birth, which is Malaysia, <laughs> or the countries I have called home, formerly Australia, and now the USA. The place of my birth is not my choice. Uh, it was the result of war. And as such, I have little or no connection to my ancestors' language and culture. I feel neither here nor there, yet I am also everywhere. In this <laughs> exhibition, we get two points of view. Uh, for Dimitri, the split between three different cultures, Greek, Mexican, and American. And for Anina, the performative nature of cultural identity from the perspective of a transplant from the Bahamas. Both artists will share images of their work from the exhibition and each will also talk through with us the works and their inspirations. We, be, we, we begin with Anina. Anina Major is a visual artist from the Bahamas whose work investigates the uh, relationships between self and place. Her work draws from anthropological research, oral histories and personal observations. Major is the recipient of numerous awards and residencies, including the uh, St. Bertolf Club Foundation, Emerging Artist Award for Sculpture, the Watershed Summer Residency, Zenobia Award, Mass Mocha Studio Artist Program, the Provincetown Fine Arts Book Center Fellowship, and the Socrates Sculpture Park Fellowship. Her work has been exhibited internationally at venues in the Bahamas, the United States, and Europe, uh, including Gallery 51 in the North Adams, Massachusetts, Fuller Craft Museum, Massachusetts, National <laughs> Gallery of the Bahamas, <laughs> Nassau, Bahamas, and Halle 14 in Germany. Major wow. studied at the College of the Bahamas before earning her BS in graphic design from Drexel University and her MFA from the Rhode Island School of Design. So Anina, you have the floor. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Laysan. So I'm just gonna... Um... <clears throat> share my screen and uh, pull up the presentation that I put together for you guys. <clears throat> so first I wanna say thank you to Laysan for giving us this opportunity to put together this show. Um, and then uh, of course, to my joint partner in this endeavor, Dimitri, thank you for uh, some of the most insightful conversations that I've ever had about kind of culture and identity. Um, a chorus, ooh, we went too fast. Uh, a chorus of marks and artifacts, to me, uh, just reflecting on the title, just the idea of this chorus, most of us think of like a group of people singing or a verse that repeats itself in a song. And, and I thought that this kind of really encapsulated everything that it was kind of going on. It's the work in this show is really, um, a collection of utterances that I like to think of that contribute to all of my thoughts around identity and um, how, how I'm mining that particular topic. When thinking about this show, reflecting back, a song that came to mind was this uh, kind of folk Bahamian song uh, that's called Sponger Money. And I'm just gonna play a little bit of it for you so that you can hear it. Cause I think it kind of introduces all of the multiple layers of things that I think about when I think about identity histories um, and as they relate to me forming one for myself. Can you hear it now? Love, yeah, love, love, yeah, yeah, got sponge your money. 
Spongebob money never done. Spongebob money. Spongebob money is a lot of fun. You got Spongebob money. Sing, girl, sing. Sing, girl, sing. Sing, girl, sing. Girl, you got strawweight money. Strawweight money never done. Strawweight money. Strawweight money is a lot of So that was just a little snippet. And I, I kind of think that that is, will be kind of like the basis for the few works that I picked to talk about today. Um, in this song, he talks about, you know, being joyful and, and happy about working basically in two particular industries, the sponging industry and the straw work industry. Um, and I have to say that it's kind of hard for me to not think about, um, these aspects when I think about identity because a lot of my history is rooted in this kind of concept of industry um, and it's something that provided a kind of economical stability for a lot of families and I am a beneficiary of that so when I think about um, how you know how do I parse through and figure out what identity is a big part of it is parsing through um, a kind of fabricated idea of what identity is and all of the things that it's related to. And so one of those things is industry. Um, and this in packaging industry, we've also like formulated these kind of identities around it and culture for the sake of tourism. Um, you get, can't get past that. And so when you start mining through it, the two industries that he's talking about in this song, sponging and straw work, I start to think about, well, how are my, how am I anchored in these ways? Uh, the first time I kind of explored this was with the piece that you see here that's titled Anchor. Um, and it's really supposed to be kind of this kind of imagining of something that sits at the bottom of, of any kind of, I mean, you could say ocean or sits at the bottom of me and pit of my stomach or whatever. Um, but this idea of containment and the ability for one to absorb uh, kind of ideals about who they are um, and how they manifest and how they kind of just stay around and uh, and they and they cap you know encapsulate into this thing. So um, this is the first time kind of exploring that, and uh, this exhibition was a good time to kind of revisit it. Um, here is a detail of the the piece. In revisiting the piece, um, I've been thinking a lot about the women, which are really the backbone of this, the Bahamian community. Um, their work and labor and the things that they produced um, are things that I have inherited, their resilience, their resourcefulness, um, and I just can't get past that. So yes, I could go back to the song, but really what I'm thinking about is the individuals and there are a lot of imagery, the same as songs out there, kind of like glorifying this labor, but not really identifying the people behind that work. Um, and so I have been collecting images that were used to kind of sell the country in a way um, during this economic boom period, which I would say is from like the 1930s to 50s, which is kind of pivotal for my grandparents and led to kind of this place that I could be here where I am now because of a woman like this. So although she's unnamed, um, this image to me is so powerful because the look in her eyes and the determination and even her body posture, um, this kind of empty vessel on the side of her that is to collect the sponges was a big inspiration for me. And it led to this piece, which uh, is in the show Cuddles in Containment. And again, just thinking about like, what we absorb, <laughs> our absorption rate, how do we contain that? Does that sit to the bottom? Does that spill out? Um, and, and is there room for more of it? Um, which, and this is uh, a back view of that exact piece. So I still reference this kind of labor with the weaving at the top and then uh, the sponges that are contained within this space. In doing that, I made a series of works where I really was digging into the land. Um, I allowed myself to be really free with the work for this exhibition. Um, this image that I have up here is of a blue hole. And 
to me, it's another kind of reference, another reference to the land instead of going back to what actually um, was manufactured for me to engage with. I'm now actually looking at the natural resource and blue holes for those who don't know are kind of like these like bottomless uh, water holes that lay in land in some way and they usually have like fresh water but they're like no animals supposedly but different types of bacteria live in them but they're just joyful and like some of my most pleasant memories are like diving in these kind of like bottomless water pits and floating and so when I think about like that kind of concept, right, of my memory and how do I build upon that, it led to like, well, how do, what do these sponges really absorb and what are they absorbing in? This piece here grown from um, is kind of an example of that where I started to actually weave outside of this kind of sponge character to make this kind of vessel that ultimately when you look down into is like this somewhat imaginary abyss of blueness um, that just all is consuming and somehow that sponge at the bottom just soaks that up for you. So this is my way of working through these themes kind of like in a material materiality way like with materials like how can I kind of express this kind of permanency with the ceramics and also this kind of ability to still absorb um, and contain as time goes on. And actually pulling from the land because that sponge is natural, not, not fabricated. Again, with images, I don't have any images of my grandmother in the straw market with me as a child, but this, I collect these vintage postcards and every time I come across one, there's like a special place in my heart. Um, and this one with this little girl and this woman, again, all of these women are nameless and, and I do not know how to kind of bring agency other than to give their craft the proper reverence. Um, but, you know, I'd like to think I'm that little girl with that hat, <laughs> um, mainly because that really was me in the summers. Um, and and this is really what it was, like being surrounded by all of this craftsmanship um, that symbolized so much for who my grandmother really was and, and um, the sacrifices she did make for her family. So while my mother is work, you could picture me in probably a red dress, just like she's wearing, um, hanging out with grandma selling the straw woven objects. Here's a studio view. I, I sometimes like to include these of works in progress um, at different stages, just to show how like, there's so many similarities between the space that I kind of create for myself and the work that gets removed from that space. Um, you know, here are the little girls surrounded by all of these things. And this is a typical view of my studio, just work that's surrounding me for me to parse through and work through these different um, kind of themes. The weaving for me is the practice. Um, I have come to a place where I've noticed that like the objects that I showed you in that image that my grandmother made are deteriorating because they are indeed made from palms. And my ability to hold on to that really is in this kind of relearning how to plait the way we call it and how to make form that is informed by my life experiences and things that I want to uh, solidify in history um, so a song lives on forever. Well, these vessels made of ceramic live on forever. And in a way I am contributing to not just what was fabricated in order to sell the country, but uh, what the people may have fabricated to say about these group of individuals. So this is one view of this piece. And here's another view. And here's like another view. There's a joyfulness that comes with um, this work. And it, it's weird because I know at the beginning we talked about like the idea of labor and this happiness around it. I think there is a level of happiness and pride um, because like I said, again, it was a way of providing economic stability um, for a lot of families that resulted in a lot of children going off to school to go to college, be educated, come back, contribute to a growing economy in other ways. 
Um, for me, I occasionally lose sight of some of the joy in that when you start thinking about all of the bad things that tourism brings and the, the colonialist nature of it. Um, however, there is something that does warm my heart and gives me a bit of the glee, glee is when I'm able to now as an artist engage in a way that remains tethered to a history um, that I'm pretty sure my grandmother never thought about. <laughs> like never thought about like leaving something out of ceramic and, and it being in a place um, and giving it that much reverence and value. So this idea of, you know, occasionally sprinkling a little bit of joy, I love. And I usually do that through the color of yellow in any of my installations or in my work. And this piece is an example of that. I have a few more shots of this. So those are just a few of the pieces I chose to talk about um, as how I'm like parsing through. And I don't know if we're gonna do questions for me now, but I think Dimitri's next. So um, thank you all again. Thank you, Anina. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so, um, well, I don't see any um, questions. Someone say woohoo, Anina. And someone says splendid, and thank you. <laughs> um, how about we just go on and uh, move on to uh, Dimitri first, and then we'll uh, handle all the Q and A's, the serious questions afterwards, right, after he finishes. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce Dimitri. Um, Dimitri Espinoza is a painter and digital artist based in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. He holds a BFA from the Massachusetts College of Art and Design, where he studied painting and printmaking. His work has been featured in the Boston Globe, Studio Visit Magazine, and numerous other publications. In addition to his studio practice, he's also a co-director of Boss Crit, a critique and curatorial club for emerging artists. So Dimitri, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. And, and thank you, Anina, for sharing your work. Um, let us do a screen share. Uh, just a moment. Great. Can everyone see the uh, images? Yeah, excellent. OK. Uh, oh, where am I here? I jumped ahead. There we go. OK. so. Where, where do I begin? I think I'll just give a little bit of like a, like a bio backstory and just talk about my work in general, and maybe a little bit about some specific pieces, but just general overview of the work. Uh, I'm Dimitri. Um, I, I am what uh, you would call a third culture kid. For anyone who knows what that means, it's essentially somebody who has grown up in a culture that is different from uh, that of their parents generally speaking. So my, my father is from Mexico, my mother is from Greece, and I was born here in the US. And so that sort of like precondition is like the foundation of um, my work as an artist. That's kind of like the, the, the crucial like element that, that drives my, my work as an artist is uh, exploring like sort of what it means to have those three identities. Um, so uh, I think that the, more specifically being, being both like Mexican and Greek and American, uh, the, the, the sort of like, there's like a kind of like cultural dissonance that I, I've experienced as, as a person growing up that has like really impacted my sense of identity and my sense of like cultural identity, that there's, you know, perhaps those who have been um, brought up in a more like homogenous, uh, cultural, culturally homogenous environment don't necessarily have to like grapple with having multiple identities. Uh, but for me, it's like the crucial foundation to my work is how much of me is, you know, Greek, how much of me is Mexican, how much of me is American. Uh, I grew up, uh, as a young person, I attended a, uh, 
like Greek elementary school that was like very highly concentrated. Um, like you, we spoke, like learned Greek uh, there along with all the other subjects and uh, everyone who attended was a Greek person. And it's very like, sort of like very like uh, concentrated like Greek community. And I think that, that that like intense concentration of like Greek culture had a really outsized impact on like my sense of uh, identity. And, and so as a young person, I, I think I, I kind of identified more as Greek than American even. Um, and, but, but then that was itself contrasted with um, like my Mexican side, my father uh, who's Mexican um, uh, had a Mexican restaurant uh, when I was a kid. And I spent a lot of my time like after school going there. And uh, you can imagine like a Mexican restaurant kind of has like, you know, it's, it's designed to have this like vibe of like be, you know, being in Mexico, like it's sombreros in the wall and, you know, uh, the smell of Mexican food. And so like sensorially, it was like very Mexican, um, which is in sharp contrast to what my mornings would be like, which were, you know, completely the opposite, you know, like very like immersed in sort of like a Greek culture. And, um, and all of that, I think, you know, leads me to where I'm at now as an artist, which is sort of just trying to like parse through a, a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the questions I have about like my own identity, like culturally speaking, um, there's a kind of like cultural dissonance that I experience uh, being Greek and being Mexican, being American, that uh, is mirrored in a lot of the mark making that uh, I employ as an artist. So a lot of a lot of my work is like uh, I don't know contrasting contrasting values, contrasting shapes, contrasting colors, like often like sharp sharp jumps in value sharp jumps in, in form uh and and that's essentially mirroring i think a lot of like the 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 disharmony and like the dissonance that i experience culturally uh, if, if that makes sense so a lot of a lot of the compositions are you know broadly speaking sort of like all over compositions and you know evoke a evoke a kind of like I don't know, movement of like, I wanna say chaos, but like sort of disarray, you know, there's there's a reflection there of, of like unease. There's like, there's a, a depiction of a, a moment of like disintegration uh, in, in a lot of my work. That's, I would say that, that that's how I would characterize like most of the compositions and, uh, and choices in terms of mark making. Um, and so a lot of the themes, like a lot of the titles have a sort of like a water theme or, but it's not necessarily that it's about water, so to speak. It's more so that that's like a, uh, like a convenient visual, uh, like metaphor for, um, I don't know, like, like disarray, if that makes sense, like water can, Water is a very like turbulent element. Um, so, and for me, my experience of, of water in that regard is, you know, things like drowning, you know, whirlpools, you know, um, like, you know, crashing waves, like this, this sort of like visual element for me is for some reason just like very exciting. And so I think I, I think that I, I lean on that quite a bit. Um, Like something like this, uh, I think is is uh, perhaps the best example of uh, lines and forms and everything coming together in a way that doesn't really doesn't really like make any coherent sense moment to moment if you're looking at the at the work itself. Um, but when you step back, there is a kind of like there is a kind of like harmony that emerges. Uh, similar to like how uh, when you experience like a texture, uh, it's like there's like a like a really rough texture, like concrete or something. Like there's 
it, it's extremely unpleasant, let's say, and like moment to moment, like on the fine details, there's, uh, uh, you know, it's like perhaps unpleasant and chaotic, but when you step back, actually concrete has a very like beautiful and smooth, like finish to it. And I think that, that that's something that I, I seek in my paintings is like on, the, on a small level, like moment to moment within the paintings, there's, there's this like um, disarray with the, the marks kind of intersecting in ways that aren't necessarily coherent, but taking a step back a little bit further and everything sort of snaps into place in a way that does make sense. Uh, my paintings are uh, ultimately singular things, right? And they are meant to, or they're, they're depicting sort of in the same way that culturally I'm like three different things, but ultimately I'm one person. So too in my paintings, is there, you know, this uh, incongruency, but ultimately it's one singular thing. Uh, and I think that's something that I, I strive to, to get across in my work. And I'm gonna flip through the last couple images. And, and that's it. Thank you so much. Okay, Dimitri. Thank you, Dimitri. That was awesome. Yay. Okay, we have actually a lot of questions. I know, I saw. <laughs> <laughs> I think Anina, you are up first because the, the first question is for yeah. you. Yeah. So this is from Alfred. Yes. And there are two questions that I think I'm going to combine into one answer, Alfred. Um, but the first one was, I'm curious as to how you navigate the inherited trauma that comes with the production of the work. And also, do you have any other aspects of your practice that involve reportage? Oh, that's really interesting that you use the word report reportage. So <clears throat> I like to think of myself as like this amateur, like historian slash like archeologist slash storyteller that's like mining through all of this material that I come across and looking for ways to um, tell it again a different way or um, uh, yeah, tell it again a different way, tell the story again a different way, bring maybe a point of view that may have been overlooked or actually, intentionally left out of the conversation and bringing that to kind of the forefront and being the highlight of the story. And unfortunately, and I do that with my artwork. Um, I think there are a lot of ways that I do that. I think that I do that sometimes with installation work. Um, sometimes that comes through in video work. And I would say occasionally like performance. Um, but the main thing that I've been focused on really is the plotting as of late. And you asked me about the inherited trauma. And I think my way of parsing through that kind of um, colonial past is focusing on the areas that have been, um, or have attempts have been to kind of culturally erase that, um, leave out the nuances and the details of the experience. I find by weaving, um, I am really engaging in a practice that probably was you know, probably shouldn't be engaged. like, I mean, ultimately I don't need to weave to survive. So my performance as an artist is not directly really related to my livelihood, which is not something that my grandmother would be able to say, right? Um, and I think that by me engaging with, with that practice um, is some way healing um, and maintaining this kind of in biblical cord to, um, the great aspects of my past that don't involve the trauma. Um, and I, so, so when I think about that question, for me, the actual plotting um, and the making um, is a way of processing through that. Uh, yeah, and then I think the next question was from Susa. I hope I said your name right. But interestingly enough, the two are related, right? I do, work with ceramics a lot. I think that's kind of the 
primary medium for me. Um, I totally didn't bring that up in my talk, but thanks for asking about it. And yes, I do consider myself a ceramic artist in some way. The question you asked is, can you talk a bit about the other media and how you come upon play as a major one? This is related to the reportage and the storyteller in me. Um, a lot of stories get lost, you know, and they continue on through song or poetry and, um, and these baskets, you know, the women who made them, they will deteriorate because they're made from palms. The sponge eventually disappears. And so I think for me, clay stays around. It's one of the few mediums that just won't go anywhere. <laughs> Even after we've left, it'll still exist. Um, and I'm infusing something into that history and that future. So we've already set the precedence of looking at pottery and um, ceramics as informing us about people um, and the existence of people in different cultures. And here I am today kind of adding to that practice of referring to ceramics in that way. So by weaving in play, I think I am contributing to the history for the future in some weird way. So I hope that kind of answers all of your questions. Okay, I think uh, we have, we have um, questions for Dimitri now. So uh, Dimitri, are you able to um, open up the Q&A box and then, yeah, uh, yeah you can yep. answer the question. Yeah, uh, from Alfred, Dimitri, how do you feel your American aspects of your influences inform your practice or mark making? Ah, specifically the American ones? Uh, interesting. I mean, I, I don't know that I do. I mean, uh, it's funny, like the, the American like aspect is sort of like, like the last thing I consider. I'm sure that it's operating on some level in me in turn, like, like subconsciously, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Uh, the The only answer I, I think I can give to that is, like, I think that I've, I've got a very like American like loudness about, you know, like my uh, approach visually. You know, like very like, hey, look at me. You know, uh, in terms of like b bold color choices and like high contrast, um, which uh, I think is distinctly American. Uh, but but maybe not. Um, and then the. Uh, second part to the question, Dimitri, how do you feel about the mythological histories of Greece and Mexico? Do you find inspiration from those sources, color or composition wise, or do you feel a psychic connection to the spiritual aspects of them that is beyond language? That's a beautiful question, Alfred. Um, I, I mean, you know, I wish I could say that I, I'm more educated on like Greek mythology, for instance. Uh, I, I really don't think about it too much. And, and I, I also think that that's kind of a lame answer. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm probably like the, the historical, uh, events I think are, are not really playing like a, a conscious role in my work. Unfortunately, I, I do think that they're incredibly important. And I think that that's a direction that I intend to take my work as it evolves more fully, but, but currently, um, uh, it's, 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 it's not quite factoring yet at the moment. Uh, and then the, can I answer another one? <laughs> right. Yes. So yes, then we have, <laughs> and then we've got Sousa about mural work. I've I've done some murals at uh, at my alma mater, at Mass Art. Uh, if anyone is in Boston and you want to go to the Kennedy Building in, in Mass Art, I've got two, one on the ground floor and one on the fourth floor. I think I don't know if they're still there. Uh, you never know if they paint over these things with, without telling you, but. Um, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, there's, there's a couple of murals there, but no, I mean, uh, I would love to do more mural work. Um, uh, that actually very much interests me. Um, uh, I, would, I would love to explore that further, yeah. There are more questions, I think. Uh, yeah. From, from Mark Brock about titles. And then also in the chat box, there are several as well. If, uh, if you both could... Uh, help read. The yeah, sure. Okay. I think, Dimitri, you have one for Mark. It's, I believe I understand how Anina arrives at her titles, but curious if you once title your works once done or is 
the concept known as a mark. Mm. Uh, I just saw that. Created. Yeah, I, I didn't scroll down. Sorry, I just I just saw that. Um, honestly, for for me, I I strictly title my paintings after the fact. That's actually I don't know if that's commonplace, but yeah, I my, my titles change a hundred times. Like I. <laughs> I, I don't even think about a title until like it's complete. First of all, you know, like I, I, it's not even worth considering a title until the thing is done, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, I mean, usually I'll, I'll, I'll set a title and I'll I'll walk away from it, and then you know, at some point I take a second look at it and I realize, oh my god, that's a stupid title for this. And <laughs> and a better, right, I mean, you know, a better word comes to mind, you know, or or once I've titled a few other pieces, then I that triggers me to like think of another piece that I titled earlier differently and I'll change the title for that reason. Like, okay, now that title no, no longer makes sense in the context of these other works. Maybe I need to change his title. And, but I'll, I'll go through like 10 or 20 revisions of a title. You know, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do weird things like turn it upside down, like <laughs> long after it's finished and titled. I don't know if anyone else does that, but because for me, because for abstract work, I mean, there's really no orientation as I'm making it. Like I'm turning them up upside down as I'm making it anyway. But even after it's done and titled, I'll turn it upside down, you know, months later and realize, oh, this was the correct orientation all along. And therefore it needs another title. So. Uh, That's yeah. so interesting. I didn't know that. I've all the times yeah. we've been talking. We've never talked about that. <laughs> That's so crazy. Because I work this same way right like I uh, work in the round sometimes I turn things upside down and I don't really know the orientation of the sculpture until I'm done there we go <laughs> it's, just, it's just really interesting that, yeah. that you mentioned that <clears throat> there we go there's another question from you from Cynthia it says like do you think about how water can take the shape of its container since water is a motif of yours uh oh I'm sorry I'm Looking that's through in it. The, oh, in, in the, the chat. chat. There's Sorry. some in the chat. I'm just like looking <laughs> over at the chat. I, I cannot multitask for the life of me. So <laughs> I, I'm realizing now there's also the chat. I'm so sorry. Do um, you think how water can take the shape of its containers since water is a motif of yours? Oh, interesting. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't think of, I think I'm thinking of water in a more turbulent way and just taking the shape of a vessel is like a more, a, is a I don't know, not I want like a more like pedestrian like uh, like identity of water or a more pedestrian like like property of water, um, which which is not how I'm thinking of water. I'm thinking of water on like more of like a like an earth scale, like that 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 like intensity and magnitude of water and 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 like the and and what results from that, you know, like geo like weather phenomena, you know, in that sense, not not quite on the scale of vessels, but I do think that's an interesting link between the ceramic work and and, and that, yeah. Yeah. Um, Akiko Jackson asked both of you questions. So I think you, um, about joy, can you both speak a little bit about your connection to joy? Um, uh, in any form, perhaps how it has the potential to intersect with your work, your culture in relation to society, critically, etc. The concept <laughs> of joy that is often so uh, it's a long question, but uh, yeah, maybe Anina, you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I think joy um, is. Oh my gosh, now the sun's killing me. It was great for a while ago. That's like, <laughs> but I think joy is definitely a tool in my uh in my box that I pull out every once in a while because I think it disarms individuals um in the work and how you receive it um this element of joy and I sometimes think about that with beauty um disarms individuals to have like tough conversations um I found that those things have really worked um as ways to draw individuals in as far as joy for myself <laughs> It's the word that's very fulfilling to me um, because, I, I, because it's tied to something that's not just like personally joy can assist with moving through the trauma and pain um, and it is critical. It's like a yin and a yang, right? Like to balance it out.
Okay, Dimitri? And, yeah, hmm, joy, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that there's joy like as like, I don't think the joy appears as, as content in my work necessarily, but the process of making it is quite joyful for me. If that answers your question, it like, I, I don't wanna do anything on this earth but paint. And uh, anyone who knows me knows like how stubbornly I like that I feel that. Um, so yeah, I mean, painting is like, you can do no wrong. It's your thing, you know, there's no right or wrong. You get you call the shots. And, and so I, I love that that freedom that it's, it's playtime for me. Painting is playtime, making is playtime. Um, uh, you know, uh, so that's where the joy lies for me. It's it's creating a thing, but but I don't think that there's joy in the works themselves as completed things, unless you experience joy viewing it, which I, I think maybe a lot of people do. I, I, I certainly in, intentionally employ the use of like highly saturated colors, which I think are you know probably coming across as pleasurable to look at. I would assume, hope. So you know, yeah, I think joy exists. In, in, on that level. Oh, thank you, Dimitri. Um, your father, Mario, asked you a question. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, he's got the caps lock on. And uh, <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, I, um, uh, I'm trying to read through the questions. What is the it's, question? It says, have ba Mexican painters influenced oh, yeah. your painting? I think you better say yes. Yeah, yeah, of course I have to say, oh, it's so funny. Yeah, so I was, uh, yes, yes, but not in like, a, I'm researching Mexican painters and then like consciously deriving, you know, some concrete influence from them. That's not, that's not how I operate, but, you know, just the general experience of like having, it, you know, in front of my eyes uh, unavoidably for sure. Um, it's so funny, uh, my, my dad and I were talking in January about Mexican painters and, uh, and in the midst of our conversation, I was Googling Mexican painters because he was like quizzing me on, on all the Mexican painters. And I was trying to pretend like I knew all of their names, and it's, but I was just Googling them. And then in the midst of me like Googling these Mexican painters, I found that there was a big uh, Mexican muralist exhibition at the Whitney uh, back in January, February. And uh, it was like the final weekend of it. And I, he convinced me to, uh, on a whim, uh, buy a, a ticket to New York to go see, I, I'm in Boston, obviously. So I bought a ticket on a whim to New York, to go to New York to the Whitney to go see that uh, Mexican muralist exhibition. And it was like one of the greatest exhibitions I've, I've ever seen. It, it props I'm a bit biased because it's Mexican muralist, but, um, uh, but then when I, and so long story short, actually looking at a lot of these paintings and drawings up front because it was a lot of, you can't really move a mural. So some reproductions of murals, but also a lot of like smaller drawings and, and um, paintings from like Diego Rivera, for instance, and which I'd never seen up close, which I, I've, I've never even like seen images of on Google. Like there's a lot of stuff that you just, that's not necessarily, you know, the first search results and, you know, when you look at Google images, right? Works that I'd never seen before. And I was quite struck to see how abstractly uh, like Diego Rivera actually like approaches his mark making. Like I, I felt like an instant kind of like affinity there. Like, okay, you're like, you're, you're holding the, like the implement in probably the same way that I'm kind of, you know, you can just tell how someone is holding something by the contour of their stroke, you know, like you can, when you've painted for you know years, I think you can kind of like pick up on that, and so there's definitely like an affinity there with with a lot of Mexican painters for sure. All right, I think we uh, answered everybody's question. So, um, uh, Dimitri, you have a lot of relatives, I think, on, on the. On the <laughs> yeah, I, it's a family affair. Do you yeah. tell us who they are? <laughs> I I mean I don't know. It's yeah, it's a lot of Espinosa. It's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. My, my father, my my sibling, my other sibling, uh, uh -huh. probably more. Um, the, yeah, there's. I, I invited everybody that I know. So yeah. that's really nice. Yeah, yeah. I, I do have a question about language. You know, you you grew up with three languages, Greek. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's fine. Mm -hmm. I How do I you never learned learn Spanish actually. So I, yeah, I never learned Spanish. My dad's gonna kill me right now. But yeah, I mean, I. Uh, <laughs> 
yeah for, i mean you know for for whatever reason that it, it, i never learned spanish uh I, I think like the the intense like concentration on like the greek culture and and greek language probably i think in my mind like took up too much space where uh yeah so yeah but i don't know does that answer your question yeah no, no, yeah um so you can speak greek uh fluently P poorly very poorly <laughs> yeah it's a, don't ask you to say anything because <laughs> okay. yeah, it'll be very embarrassing <laughs> okay so yeah. and you know i i'm also curious about you know the your um your ancestors you know like uh, <laughs> a lot of west african uh, uh were taken to uh the, uh the caribbeans so what are you what how do you feel that what are you connected to uh is it completely lost to you um I don't know if it's completely lost to me. I think that there is, um, I think there's some uncanny things that just traveled along, you know, like we're dealing with, you know, my history has a lot of cultural erasure in the sense that just things have been left out. And I think that what's beautiful is how you see these kind of themes or shapes or, um, practices resurge in areas um, and people don't know how they got there. <laughs> like, that's one of the things that I think is really amazing and like plotting is like that, the weaving, like no one really has documented or knows how this even got to the Bahamas, but it's believed that it has come through the Atlantic slave trade. And, and I actually kind of believe that too, because in my process of reteaching myself this thing I learned as a child, you know, typical contemporary fashion. I Googled it and <laughs> I found YouTube videos of women in Ghana and uh, all over the continent of Africa practicing different forms of weaving. And some of them, I couldn't even tell the difference. The only thing that gave me a clue that we were not in the Bahamas was the fact that like the ground was different, the land, you know, like I could see the ground. But for the most part, um, it was silent. So, you know, I've done some video work around that and how we have these kind of kinship connections that we don't really talk about. You know, I've seen evidence of like relationships with um, the Gullah Geechee people um, in the North Carolina, South Carolina kind of corridor area. Um, and we don't really have any documentation on that other than, well, clearly, slavery because one people people wear hair one group people wear hair and so we came from one place like there's really no like um kind of i guess i guess there's scholarly assumptions based on the way that we're behaving um in in the contemporary sense uh, and i think that's the same for kind of my loki you know which i created unbeknownst to anything and the most African pottery, I created those objects kind of thinking about the marketplace and home and things that would signify home and how to protect home and what would be like an aggressive object that could protect. And I thought about the blowfish that like can be beautiful, but also can be extremely dangerous if you touch it. So like I started making these ceramic spike objects that I call Loki and I said that they were kind of protecting the spirit of a particular place within my own identity. And then I find out about, you know, the Loki jars <laughs> and how they are believed to be, you know, ancient pottery from Africa that like har harvested like a protection or um, spirit of place. And I'm like, what? It's wow. uncanny. Yeah. So I think there's so many things that, and I, and I love it when that happens in my practice. I think there's so many things that you know, have been consciously left out of books and literature, but will show up anyway, right? And I think yeah. doing this kind of work reinforces those connections. Okay, well, it's as if it's in your DNA, it just came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah it yeah. is. I know, yeah. it's kind of crazy, yeah, to think about that, yeah. Um, okay, so Mary Tuli Parker has a question. I think we're gonna wrap up very soon. So I think this will be the last question we take. Um, so Dimitri, uh, the question is for you. It's in the Q and A uh, box. Oh yeah, sorry, I was I was on mute. Um, yeah, can you talk a little bit about your 
what you feel causes the distance between your functional background. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's, I think like the, like one of event that really primed me to feel that there's a dissonance there is the fact that my parents are divorced, uh, which uh, is, you know, like at, at the time, I mean, uh, at the time, you know, a, a divorce is like, you know, this tense thing, you know, and I was like four or five years old. And, and I think that like experiencing that kind of like primed me to view like, those cultural identities of Mexican Greek somehow like somehow like that that like reflected that tension in some way uh, and and I think that I, I you know this like thought you know became present in my mind of like maybe there's some kind of like inherent incompatibility between being Mexican and being Greek which of course is not true whatsoever but like as a five-year-old uh, I think that that's that's just like where my mind went is like this you know there's there's a symbolism there is like the two not together you know um so that's a very like maybe like primitive you know understanding of it but you know five years old right um uh but i think that 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 got like the ball rolling so to speak uh um but it wasn't just that i mean i think that's just like one one like small snippet um yeah did I answer your question i think you go <laughs> yeah Oh, I think we've got one that snuck in. So Hugo asked you a question. We'll, we'll answer Hugo's question. Yeah. Uh, Hugo's my my half brother. Um, oh. Yeah. Do you do you feel influenced in some way by your visits to the ocean? Interesting. Um, no, I mean, no. Yeah, I mean, the thing like the thing about influence is, I th I'm probably influenced by all kinds of things, but but I think that that operates on more like a subconscious level. If that makes sense, like I, I, I very rarely feel like I'm consciously influenced by anything. Uh, it's only really apparent, if at all, like after the fact when I'm st stepping back and analyzing the completed thing itself. Then I kind of connect the dot back, connect the dots backwards, and realize, oh, okay, here's here's a theme. You know, like the the water theme didn't really become apparent to me until, you know, after all the work was made, and I stepped back and in my discussions with Amina, like uh, like the. the it sometimes it's like an, analyzing and discussing after the fact that makes certain influences that were already operating you know beneath the surface the whole time makes them actually clear to you so yeah i mean i don't know visiting the ocean maybe but but uh, consciously i don't think there's necessarily anything there okay wonderful i think uh, uh the one hour passed by so quickly because everybody all, both of you are amazing presenters, and I learned so much about both of you. And all these uh, the stuff that you were uh, telling us, they are so personal. And so, um, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your, your life with us. So, um, okay, I'm, uh, we will wrap up now. I want to tell everybody that uh, there will be a uh, in-person opening reception next Saturday, June 12th, uh, 4 to 6 uh, in Boston in my gallery. So the location is 460C Harrison Avenue, Boston, Massachusetts. So uh, please come and uh, celebrate this occasion with uh, the two artists if you are in town. Um, if not, please check out the show online. Uh, we are everywhere. We are on social media. We are on, uh, on my wonderful website, my beautiful website. We are also on Artsy. So yeah, please uh, check out all the wonderful uh, works by both uh, amazing artists. Um, uh, in this exhibition and then you know uh, send us any comments you have you know let us know how you feel about them and you know yeah we, I think we we would uh, appreciate you know uh, any um, feelings and comments you have about them um, okay so are we gonna I, I'd like to thank both of you thank you so much uh, Anina and Dimitri for coming on uh, this zoom this webinar and thank you everyone who attended uh, we, we, I think we had everybody who came and no, no one dropped out. So, wow. <laughs> Yay. Because we were talking about Zoom, Zooming are being, you know, Zoom fatigued. So, but I'm, you know, it's an achievement. Thank you so much. So uh, we'll, we'll catch up with you, all of you uh, offline, uh, you know, send me email, um, uh, text me uh, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, resume our conversation from there. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.